Here we go. Good God. The first season of 13 Reasons Why was a horrible, kind of insulting, poorly thought through mess. I found it entertaining enough for what it was as a shallow, overly dramatic teen drama, but what bothered me most was how the show came across as if its themes and messages were important and worth discussing, while at the same time grossly oversimplifying and at some points romanticising the heavy and serious subject matter they were trying to tackle all the subtlety of a bull in a china shop. The muddled writing simply wasn't good enough to justify what the show was trying to achieve. Netflix even added in extensive trigger warnings shortly after the first season was released almost as damage control because of how botched and on the nose the message of the show was. It was clearly controversial, but if you took out all the triggering scenes, all you're left with is a pretty by the book stupid high school fairy tale. That leads us on to season 2, which is so incredibly dull and laughably stupid at points that I'm even more irritated by the way the show continues to flaunt itself, as if it's somehow a breakthrough in mental health awareness and other serious and complicated issues. I suppose complicated really is the word for it. 13 Reasons Why tries to explain and rationalise unfathomably complex concepts using simplistic layman's logic, which often shows a complete lack of awareness or understanding. If the show didn't act like it has this holier-than-thou, greater purpose and embraced its outrageous characters and story, then it might sit better with me. But they don't do that, so it doesn't. This is a f***ing joke! Season 2 is structured around the Hannah Baker versus the school court case, with every episode, bar the last, being framed by the various witnesses giving their testimonies, usually in the form of narration that conveniently happens to relate to the various flashbacks and other plot points. Much like the first season, it is quite non-linear, meaning you are constantly jumping through time with flashbacks. Some of the plot delivery is surprisingly clever, but it's not without its fair share of completely baffling and confusing revelations that I'm sure make the first season make even less sense if watched in junction with one another. I'll never fully know because I refuse to watch the first season more than the one and a half times I already have. From this point on, I'm going to be spoiling major elements from season one and two, so you've been warned. Outside of the overarching court case, you have stories with Clay, who is still trying to deal with the events of the first season, Alex, who is revealed to have survived his attempted suicide and is struggling with the amnesia, yeah, that old chestnut, and the depression of being now physically disabled, Justin, who is now a homeless heroin addict, who the other characters need as a valuable witness. So I'm just reading this and just seeing how completely overdramatic it is. Jessica, who learns to cope with the trauma from the first season. Tony, who has to deal with his anger issues. Bryce, who continues to be a mustache twirling villain who ends every scene he's in by going, yeah, man, whatever. They're just lying, man. I didn't do it. Oh no, they don't care. Tyler, who's built up to be a school shooter, and Olivia Baker, who is trying to get justice for her daughter. There are way more characters in the show of note, but this video will be endless if I don't leave some of them out. The major hook of the story is that there's a mysterious person, or persons, that is threatening the main cast to try to scare them into keeping their mouths shut for the trial. Twelve episodes, and hours, later, you find out it was a minor jock character who happened to be a witness to Hannah Baker's assault and didn't stop it, and he doesn't want people to know that. Then in the end, Bryce is found not guilty, but he's arrested right after because Jessica confessed with Justin, and then Justin is also arrested. This sounds like I'm describing playground drama, and that's pretty much what it is. Then the last episode is basically nothing but set up for an inevitable season three. The story is obviously trickled out over many, many hours, and has a couple of twists and turns, one especially frustrating one involving physical evidence that could end the show there and then, being stolen and then destroyed. But all of that is basically what happens. Most of the intricacies come from scenes where characters talk talk to each other about their secrets, and how Hannah has impacted their lives and ruined them or whatever. The plot really isn't that important, it's more of a backdrop to shove in a lot of scenes where characters cry, argue, cry, get angry, cry, and whatever other negative emotions humans have. The trial hook is so much weaker than the tape structure of the first season. I remember finding the first season a lot more bingeable and entertaining in comparison to the meandering slow pace of the second. The testimonies range from really interesting and emotional all the way to inconsequential and excessively dull. My personal favourite episodes were 6 and 8, involving a pretty solid relationship that we never knew about that took place before the first season involving Hannah and the jock 
Zack. Both of these episodes touch upon ideas and morals that are actually quite effective and teach a real lesson. I'll get more into that kind of thing later though. The biggest hurdle the second season story has to jump is that its very existence makes no sense. There was clearly no plan for what was going to happen after season one, so huge chunks of the show are dedicated to trying to convince us why it exists in the first place. They constantly use the excuse of, well, Hannah didn't put everything on the tapes, in an attempt to explain how they keep dropping these huge bombshells of information that you would have thought Hannah would have mentioned in the first season. The jock, Zack, who I just mentioned, got an entire tape in the first season, and yet his extensive relationship with Hannah was not even mentioned once in the first season. This retroactive style of storytelling leads to this incredibly confusing mess of story threads that more often has you questioning how or why something is happening, as opposed to being surprised that it did. As muddled as the first season was. We always had Clay there with us as the central protagonist. We learn new information at his pace and from his perspective, but now the perspective is shared by a ridiculously huge assortment of characters. This leads to an otherwise extremely simple and easy to follow story becoming needlessly complicated. Its structure weirdly reminded me of Game of Thrones at points, simply because there was such a huge amount of characters and stories I had to juggle fairly. This leads to the show handing its focus away from Clay, arguably the best thing about it to begin with. Clay has basically nothing to do in season two. The writers usually use him as a tool to say or do something incredibly stupid so other characters can correct him on why he's wrong or being offensive or to just be overly dramatic. Seriously, Clay? You're gonna blame the girls? No, I just... His character, like most in the show, becomes extremely repetitive because it's so one note and without any depth. He was in love with Hannah and is still completely obsessed with her and nearly drives himself to complete insanity, to the point where he ruins his own relationships and even comes close to killing himself because of it. He only starts to heal and put it to rest by the final episode of the season, which means it takes well over 20 hours to complete this character's arc. I would be fine with this if it resulted in some kind of interesting drama and scenes, but most of the time it's just some variation on the same scene over and over again. His character in season two might have been more bearable if the show didn't decide to go with one of the most appallingly implemented uses of a hallucination or dream character I have ever seen. For some reason, Hannah could not only be relegated to flashbacks where her presence actually makes sense, but she comes back into the show in the form of Clay's in a conflict or something. So you talk now? Apparently. It's never really explained what's going on whenever she shows up in scenes that are based in the present. She's just a, a ghost thing that is there. Sometimes Ghost Hannah helps Clay with what to say. It's chills, he has a fever. It's chills, you have a fever. Well, get him another blanket. Other times he has full conversations with the ghost in public for everyone to see, and no one reacts. He even tries to kiss the ghost at one point, which is pretty funny. It's the execution I have a problem with more than the concept here. If it was supposed to be a stylistic decision, to visually give us a point of reference for Clay's in a conflict, then its clumsy implementation leaves a lot to be desired. We're talking about a show that prides itself on its accurate depiction of mental illness, and yet has a character who sees and talks to a ghost? Or is this implying that Clay's gets schizophrenic or something? Or is it a narrative device? The fact I even have to ask this question proves to me that it failed in what it was trying to achieve. More often than not, it comes across as excessively cheesy and unintentionally hilarious. What the fuck? Especially after seeing the masterful way this similar concept is pulled off in Mr. Robot. In comparison, it just seems confused and aimless. Could they really not think of any other way to visualize what Clay was thinking? I think it would have worked much better if they established that Clay is either daydreaming or imagining Hannah by having time pause or having some kind of visual indicator to show that it's all in Clay's head and that he's not just completely losing his mind. I know you might think that this helps establish how Clay really is losing his mind, but to me it's just too goofy for a show that takes itself so seriously. There are other ways to have Clay talk to himself. Hell, in the first season, Tony fulfilled the same role, but actually was logical in why he was there. The first season seemed to be setting up what appeared to be a possible school shooter in the making with the character Tyler. I thought that would be way too obvious and would wind up probably being oversimplified and laughable. And guess what? This character is oversimplified and laughable. They even play with our expectation of him being a shooter type, because at points the show actually tries to trick you into thinking he's doing something worse than he is. <laughs> the 
The show has a real problem with overcompensating for the motivation of their most extreme characters. The writers clearly feel like they have to come up with rational and understandable reasons as to why characters end their own lives and other radical behaviours, and almost completely ignore the fact that mental health simply is not that binary. You don't have to have the exact same ridiculous backstory as Hannah Baker to feel suicidal. You don't need to have the ridiculously over-the-top history of bullying and abuse to become a shooter. The show almost has this underlying message, intentional or not, of, if anyone does anything mean to you, then ending your own life or shooting up a school would be the most obvious decision and best revenge. And that's a dangerous concept to be introducing to some of the younger people you know tune into this show. What if you're a young, confused kid who has all these feelings, and this show is telling you, oh, I guess that's what I should be doing? How I should be reacting? No! Tyler in season 2 goes through a bunch of relatively normal teenager behaviours and it's treated as if these things are perhaps assisting his motivation in becoming a shooter? It's never made particularly clear though. He gets bullied and harassed constantly, he's an introverted, socially inept loser, he becomes friends with the punk kids and listens to punk music, he enjoys shooting guns in the woods, even though there are multiple scenes dedicated to how this character clearly cares about gun safety and how to use them responsibly, as well as hunting and shooting being a very common practice in America. So I really don't know if this is trying to be pro or anti-gun at all. And he gets a girlfriend but then blows it and loses her and his only friend because of somewhat understandable reasons for someone his age. There is an argument to be made whether these things do or do not directly assist with what ultimately makes him a potential shooter in the end. But my problem is that the message with this character is so utterly confused. His story ends with his character being sodomized by a broom handle in the toilets and then deciding to shoot up the school dance, which is then stopped by Clay because he's such a good guy. To me it would make much more sense, based on what we know about this character, that he would end his own life or would maybe exact revenge on those who assaulted him, not head to a school dance with the intent of well, we don't actually know what his intent is because it's all inferred and implied. So what ends up happening is that nearly every scene with this character is made completely pointless because his real motivator is being assaulted in the bathroom. As far as we know, this character has no history of mental illness that we're made aware of, aside from a minor subplot about him being expelled from school, but they're never explicit about it. So in a way, the show is trying to tell us that it is rational for someone who is bullied and assaulted to grab a weapon and plan to murder schoolmates with it. If he was actually mentally ill and it was a established early on, then the message would be that there needs to be more support and awareness for mental health. What we get instead is a confusing message about how bullying is bad because it makes people drive themselves to either suicide or violence. Like, what is the solution here? How are we supposed to tackle such a vague concept? Yes, bullying is bad, we all know that. No one is defending that. Okay. In my opinion, Tyler is one of the worst aspects of the show. It shows a total misunderstanding not only in how to write a convincing and understandable character, but also how to totally mismanage the idea that this show is supposed to start a conversation. Start a conversation. The conversation about this character starts and ends with bullying and assault is bad. The exact same thing the first season tried to do. There would have been ways, using the pieces that are in place already, to make this character's journey make sense. But at every opportunity they drop the ball and continue the never-ending string of bad decisions. There isn't much to say about the dialogue except that it sucks. It really, really sucks. Here are a few examples of how out of touch, ignorant, and on the nose it can be. I don't know that you're ready to- What, to know the truth? Or know I did it? You have a cane and a scar. All my scars were inside. <laughs> I took pictures of you while you were in your coma. Why did I do this to myself? Movies and shows are a wonderful way to open up a dialogue. This is Tyler, my fellow ass class colleague and extreme outcast. He's like the last person in the world left that doesn't know what his Patronus is. <laughs> Fucking muggles. Right? I had to constantly remind myself that most of these characters are supposed to be 17, because the words they say sound like what adults would imagine a teenager to sound like, instead of what a teenager actually sounds like. It's not a complete loss, however. There are some genuine and convincing uses of relatable and memorable dialogue, but I think it's more down to the talent of the actors above the quality of the writing.
The presentation of the show is easily one of the strongest aspects. It is extremely inconsistent, but when it finds its footing, it can be quite visually compelling when it wants to be. Just little techniques I notice, such as having the camera stay rolling to do both a shot and reverse shot in the same take, make what could otherwise be a pretty flat scene a lot more flowing and dynamic. Episode 8 even begins with an extremely well-executed wanna that transitions through nearly every major character in a way that felt natural and without being too show-offy. It really felt like the best way to shoot a sequence like that, and they made it work pretty well. I noticed that the visuals varied mostly on who was directing each episode. It was either creative, well-shot and entertaining, or extremely by the books and forgettable. The music also varies massively in quality. The original score sometimes works, but at times it's far too intrusive. I also don't particularly understand the choice to have it be synth. I guess because referencing the 80s is what's in at the moment. I think this same team with better base material could do a pretty good job at making a story like this come to life. But like everything else in the show, it's held back by how repetitive and poorly written it is. I think the acting is the main reason anyone would defend this show. Dylan Minnette as Clay Johnson is an extremely talented actor who pours his absolute heart and soul into every scene he's in. He's probably the best actor in the show. It's just such a shame that most of the time he's relegated to awful scenes with Ghost Hannah or spouting out ridiculous tween dialogue. He really doesn't have much to work with. And the same thing applies to pretty much everyone. I really enjoyed Derek Luke and Kate Walsh who gives it her all and quite a lot of the expansive cast is quite good. I think a couple of notable weak performances, even with the terrible writing holding them back twofold, are Devon Druid as Tyler and Miles Heiser as Alex. These poor actors have two of the worst characters in the show to try and make work. They could probably be fine with the right material and direction, but I find these characters in particular to be irritating. Certain Reasons Why thinks it has a lot to say, and it kind of does. It has a certain arrogance about it more often than it doesn't, although that probably comes from the way the show is talked about by its creators more than the show itself. At points it tries to tackle heavy social themes such as racism, drug abuse, bullying, toxic masculinity, disability, sexuality, and of course sexual assault. These are all delicate issues that require a considerate, thoughtful, and respectful approach. I think to the show's credit, for some of these they get one or two things right. I thought the way they handled the toxic masculinity masculinity, or more just how the teenagers stereotypically find it difficult to emote, and that it's okay to do so, is one of the stronger lessons the show has to offer. It's not exactly subtle about it, but it's one of those issues that isn't offensive to anyone to show in practice, so in comparison to how they treat bullying and sexual assault, it seems understated. I find their approach to the scenes that they describe as triggering to be massively ham-fisted though. There's this weird scene where Tyler shows Alex pictures he took of him in the hospital from when he was recovering from his suicide attempt. I don't know why why he was in there taking pictures of him but anyway they make sure to not show the pictures to the audience because we already know that it would be disturbing and our imaginations can do the work for us his reaction is more than enough we would gain nothing from seeing a graphic recreation of the violence at first this made me think that they'd learned from their mistakes they made in the first season with their ridiculously graphic scenes of violence but as you already know because i mentioned it earlier the scene with tyler in the bathroom is an example of how to not do a scene like this it is simply too far in my opinion all that needs to be done or a few cuts and it would be significantly more acceptable. I would much prefer the violence to be implied over explicitly shown. If it was done that way then you would avoid grossly offending those who consider the show to be nothing but shock value and purposefully triggering to those sensitive to that kind of imagery. And almost more importantly it would be more tasteful. I know some people consider it to be an unflinching, more realistic look at reality, and that hiding it away would kind of defeat the point. I can understand that to a certain extent, except when you listen to the creator of the show explain his reasoning behind the choice of making that scene so graphic, and you learn that it was mostly to make you feel sympathy for a character you may otherwise not relate to or understand, then that strikes me as an exceptionally cheap move that almost trivializes what the act involves. It takes something horrific and uses it as a sympathy cheat card to sell in for how poorly they've developed the character up until this point, so they can feel justified in then turning him into a shooter. The show earns its reputation for being exploitative nonsense when it has terrible scenes like that. The only other point I have about clumsy social commentary is the way they both condemn and unintentionally romanticise drug abuse. On one hand they have Justin, the heroin addict who is miserable and is completely ruined by addiction, but then they somewhat damage the image by having a goofy scene where the main characters take Molly, and it's depicted as if they're smoking weed or something? with a strange animated sequence. I just don't know what they were going for there. It seems like a strange choice to even go near something like this, considering how everyone is looking for contradictions and poorly thought out scenes to criticise.
They try their best to accurately depict mental illness over the abysmal attempt the first season made. And while it probably is a little bit better than the first season in that regard, it still isn't brilliant. The inclusion of the Hannah ghost almost completely undermines some of it to me, as I mentioned earlier, because at the same time as having goofy scenes with a ghost, they randomly reveal that a supporting character from the first season is bipolar. A strange decision because this character has basically no development at all. So her character ends up being that she is bipolar, instead of her being a character that happens to be bipolar. Bipolar. Every scene with her references the fact that she self-harms or depicts some instance of mania, and it's not that it's necessarily inaccurate to what the incredibly complex disorder can make one do, but it is certainly oversimplified, and they took the cheapest and easiest way of shoving it in for mental health awareness points. You have to ask yourself what value there is to dedicating a character slot to someone who only exists to effectively be pointed at and analysed as a patient. But every chance they get, they insist on placing their ham-fisted agenda of starting a conversation above of storytelling and character development. Hey look guys, it turns out anxiety runs in the Baker family. Remember that anxiety is difficult to manage? Let's start that conversation and head over to 13reasonswhy.info for more information. Right, okay, what, uh, what mental illness is next on the agenda? We can just shove in. Oh, here we go. Uh, Alex is depressed because of how his suicide attempt left him. Let's start the conversation on depression. Head over to 13reasonswhy.info for more information. Awesome, we can check that one off the list too. Brilliant. Every single character is defined by either a mental illness or a tragic event. If you took those attributes away from them, they would hardly be characters on their own. Who really is Clay Jensen if you take away his involvement with Hannah or Sky the Bipolar Girl? What defines Jessica if you take away her assault? They're all two-dimensional drama displays. Spencers. It's ironic because the show is all about the fact that mental illness and tragedy doesn't define you, and yet it defines most of the show's characters. Everything points to the fact that there was no plan for what to do for a second season of the show. They attempt to simplify the structure to keep it organised with the different testimonies, but it doesn't get close to the focus of the first season, so they felt the need to fill yet another 13 episodes full of crap that barely makes any sense. The first season has the source material of the book to base things off, but now we're in uncharted territory and it really shows. Every episode is pumped full of so much filler that it's close to exploding. There are so many scenes that clearly have no greater purpose other than to fill time. A lot of Netflix shows do this. The Marvel shows in particular are bad for it. So you end up with the majority of episodes being pointless, with everything of consequence happening towards the last few entries. It gets repetitive to the point of predictability. Nearly every single character interaction boils down to some variant of, hey, are you okay? What do you think? Of course not. Look, we've, we've just got to act normal. Normal? Nothing's been normal ever since what happened with Hannah. End scene, repeat. 13 Reasons Why is a miserable show. The best and worst things about it are all because of the despair the show is built around. I don't have a problem with attempting to tackle weighty and complicated subject matter, but we're over 26 hours deep with virtually no levity at all. I think there's a reason films like Requiem for a Dream, Train Spotting, and Detachment are all under two hours. How much time does it take to really emphasize and explore the message without having anything else to fall back on? Unlike something like Train Spotting that adds levity to the despairing subject matter with comedy, Without any contrast of emotions, everything winds up feeling hopeless and overbearing, and the rare times where they do attempt to have humour falls hilariously flat on its face because the comedic dialogue is just as bad as the serious dialogue which means it sucks. Mr. Robot is a show that deals with mental illness and addiction, but the difference is there's a lot more to chew on than just those concepts on its own. It has a plot, action sequences, and interesting characters independent of all those themes. The same could be said for shows like Bojack Horseman, which is so much better at portraying mental illness and substance abuse than 13 Reasons Why is. And shows like Homeland even have a bipolar character in the lead role. But that show isn't only about the fact that she has a mental illness, it's a crime drama about a CIA operative dealing with a potential undercover agent. I remember being taught what a metaphor was when I was in primary school. It's one of the most useful and important aspects of telling a story with any level of depth. Films like Annihilation, Anomalisa, Little Miss Sunshine, and endless other examples effectively set out with the same vague goal as 13 Reasons Why does, but they all understand the two major things you need to tell a complex story dealing with oppressive themes. It needs subtlety, and it needs to be 
Interesting. Why do you think everyone likes science fiction so much? Sure, it has spaceships and robots, but the core idea is that it's a fantastic platform for starting a conversation and making us think about race issues, what it means to be human, technology developing into dangerous territory, and so on and so forth. I think this is one of the main reasons that there is such an outcry against 13 Reasons Why. Without its inconsistent commentary on social issues, it really has no reason to exist. In its attempt to self-aggrandize its own importance, it somehow forgot to be, well, entertaining. Let's wrap this up by talking about how awful in particular the 13th episode of season 2 is. Episode 12 felt like the natural conclusion to the season, but it didn't get controversial enough, so they had to shove in a final, exceptionally long episode to leave an especially sour taste in our mouths. It starts with a strange scene in court where the show grinds itself to a halt to show a montage of women admitting to various horrors they've experienced at the hands of men, breaking the narrative to ensure that it is starting a conversation. I don't really have a problem with the message in and of itself, it's just that a Again, it is so on the nose. It's about as heavy-handed as those ridiculously over-the-top drink drive adverts. <laughs> There's a very, very long funeral sequence where Clay sees his last Hannah ghost vision, and then Clay's family adopts Justin, the heroin addict, into their family. I suppose this is the show's idea of levity. Then we get to the scene where the jock assaults Tyler with a broom, and says, well, Why did you come back? You ruined everything! Which to me is such a stretch because Tyler didn't really ruin anything. Bryce kind of did. Anyway, we've already talked about why this is the worst scene in the show, so let's move on. After the shock value is over, there's a school dance interspliced with scenes of Tyler preparing to go on a rampage. Page. It's revealed that Bryce's girlfriend is pregnant, so expect abortion to be one of the conversations for next season. I'm pregnant. Can't wait to see how terribly they handle that one. We finally get to what looks like is about to be a full-on school shooting. The girl who Tyler blew it with receives an alarming text from him and shares it around the main characters. But instead of being intelligent and using the time they have to call the police and maybe barricade the doors and hide, Clay instead says, no, we can't call the police, his life will be over. Yeah, sorry fella, you, you've kind of decided that your life is over the second you arm yourself and head to a school meetup with the intentions to hurt people. Like a goddamn idiot, Clay runs outside and confronts him head on in one of the most inept and ridiculous scenes in the entire series. A scene so poorly constructed and moronic that within the first five minutes of the behind the scenes Netflix special, 13 Reasons Why Beyond the Reasons, the assistant professor of psychiatry they have for fact checking confirms how terrible and poorly thought out that decision making is. What Clay did was actually really dangerous. Certainly we would never advise anyone who's exposed to an active shooter to confront them, even if it's a loved one. Mm -hmm. We would advise to get away. Meanwhile, the creator of the show nods along and one of the writers stares at the floor blissfully unaware. One of the strangest decisions in my mind is that the character Alex, who really didn't have a solid reason to attempt to end his own life in the end of season one, whose motivations get really clumsily retroactively explained in season two, should have just been swapped with Tyler. If any character in the show has motivation to attempt something like this, it would be him. It makes Tyler's entire character come across as if he's being played for nothing but controversy. He had legitimate reasons to attempt suicide all season long, and yet they still use him for a school shooting because it's more shocking. So despite Clay and Tyler having virtually no established relationship, he winds up potentially taking the blame for Tyler's decisions because he feels sorry for him? Why? Is this character really that much of a moron? Okay, whatever, it's a cliffhanger. Tune in next season to see what else the creators and the writers can botch. 13 Reasons Why is constructed around a catch-22. Because the show is built around nothing but controversy, the only reason it exists is to show offensive scenes that start a conversation. But if they don't show the scenes, then there won't be controversy, so it won't start a conversation in their eyes. So to them, what they're doing is working. If they really truly cared about the messages that they're trying to preach, then they would have changed things to be more tasteful after season one. But they repeated every single mistake, and in some instances even did a worse job. I'd be happy if it ended at this point, but it'll probably go for another five seasons, and I'll be here to complain about every single one of them. Bye.